Hi there, welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you here today for what promises to be a really interesting and informative discussion on partnership regeneration. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Simon Martin, the head of regeneration at Baines, and Richard Pierce, who is the founding director of TCN. And TCN are a company that rescues and converts beautiful old historic buildings into thriving office communities. So the format of the masterclass today is as follows. I'll be doing a brief introduction, brief, I promise, um, followed by Simon, who will be setting the scene and talking about the regeneration of this area of the city. We will then go into a conversation between Richard and Simon and the session finishes with some Q&A based on the questions that um, have been submitted. So just to kick off, what is Bath right. South Keys? Well, In short, it is the start of a new commercial area for the city of Bath, and it's right next to the station on a derelict industrial site. Simon will, will talk in more detail about this. But the scheme comprises of five key components. So the first two components are the infrastructure components. Before the site could go ahead, um, there needed to be a flood alleviation scheme and a new bridge has been installed. The second two components are the, office, the offices, a new build office um, constructed by Baines, and then the refurbishment of the Newark Works by TCN. And then the whole scheme is linked together by the public realm. So why is the scheme special for Bureau Happold? I think the answer to this is, is threefold. And firstly, and rather selfishly, because it's right on the doorstep of the Bureau Happold offices, we've been here for 40 years and it's absolutely lovely that we're gonna be right at the heart of this new buzzing um, commercial community. Secondly, there are 400 engineers in, in my office. I head up the Bath office and it's and we do engineering all around the globe, but nothing is more satisfying than kind of bringing that engineering home and doing it right on your own doorstep. And then the last reason why it's special to us is that this is the sort of project that is going to become more and more important as we address the climate emergency. Historically, these industrial derelict sites in the centres of our cities have been sort of put in the too hard box. But actually, now is the time when we need to put all our efforts and ingenuity into making the most efficient use of our resources and creating communities in the hearts of our cities. So at Bureau Happel, we really enjoyed working in partnership with Simon and Richard on this project. I'll now hand over to Simon for the intro to the scheme. Thank you, Claire. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this project was really born out of a, um, a long-standing aim of our 2005 economic strategy around rebalancing our economy with a really clear objective to tackle two key economic issues. The first being a relatively low wage economy and one that tends to be rather over-reliant on tourism and retail jobs locally. And the second being that we have quite an hourglass economy as well. So we have a high proportion of low value jobs and a high proportion of very high value jobs, but quite a thinning out in the middle salary bands. So the economic imperative was really to try and tackle that through the creation of a, a, of a sustainable supply of office accommodation within the city that enabled companies to grow. If you can move on slide, please, Alex. Thank you. And it, it, it kind of really um, sort of balances out the perception of Bath as this kind of world heritage visitor attraction city uh, with the need to be 
economically prosperous and provide a really good opportunity for skills and careers and jobs locally for our residents. If you move slides, please. Thank you. So the start of this was really to establish an enterprise zone through in 2015 through the government's actions to set up enterprise zones, create a financial fiscal boundary that enabled um, councils to ring fence and uh, business rates retention from business, future business rates growth to invest in infrastructure that would then enable that growth to occur. Um, so that was really the mechanism that enabled the council to undertake a fairly comprehensive master planning exercise of the city to start to characterise new zones within the city really around creating more of an innovation quarter, um, a, a place for business in the city, something that the business could point to and see visibly as a business district that was for, you know, um, for the growth of companies, for businesses, for jobs in the city, um, rather than the current kind of very dispersed um, office offer we have in the city um, through a city gateway, which is really around the reprovision of, of, of creating a better infrastructure links into the city centre down through the river corridor and following the Avon down to residential quarter, which repurposes other industrial, former industrial land for residential dwellings, which is now Bath Riverside, down into looking at how we retain and um, maintain some industrial stock and um, industrial activity in the city centre. If you move slides, please. Um, and that really led to a master plan exercise that had two key common purposes. One was to create links between all the various communities of Bath and it's a very compact city Bath so we have a lot of small communities um, very close by and very um, linked into the city centre but with quite poor connectivity particularly around sustainable and active travel so the concept was very much to use the river um, and create river crossings at fairly equidistant distances along the river so it joined communities together as well as joining the city centre. If you move slides please. Um, and so the purpose of the council's role in this was really to start to think about using our assets um, and our existing municipal assets, particularly in the form of Avon Street car park um, and some of the former Stoddard and Pitt site that, that was um, then at that point in time held derelict um, from an exercise to try and bring a previous scheme forward in the late 90s, early 2000s, and start to think about how we utilise that to stimulate that economic activity um, and repurpose these sites for a broader economic outcome than the, the uses they had at the time. If you move forward, please. Um, and what that really did was lo looking at the kind of quality of some of these sites. Um, and some of these are still, as, as you know, still standing and still there, but that taking these and, and whilst not trying to lose some of the municipal purpose of them, really rethink the role of these sites um, within the city um, and how we would use them and draw them together to redevelop as a proposition um, to create that economic kind of stimulus for the city and re-provide office accommodation, much of which has been lost through permitted development activity in the city in conversion to student accommodation and residential accommodation. Next slide, please. Um, the start point for this was really to, to work out and, and tackle the issue that all of this land sits within an active floodplain um, on the adjacent banks of the River Avon. Um, the Avon is a, it has a strong conveyance um, and conveys you know, most of Wiltshire's flood runoff um, through the city. Um, and rather than the traditional form of, of a kind of attenuation facility where you create additional storage um, offline. The solution here was to improve the, the conveyancing capacity of the river and to do that we needed to form a partnership with the Environment Agency, use some of the Environment Agency powers and enable a flood solution to come forward along the river that improved the conveyance of the river in state so that in flood times more flow remained in channel enabling us to, to, to lift essentially the sites on either side of the river out of the floodplain. Um, and that was the first step in realising and enabling these sites to come forward. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and then that, that flood conveyancing work, which really stands out actually is a very strong white line on this, on this um, slide in aerial view, enabled us to start to plan for the regeneration of site. But to do that and to certainly engage the market and the likes of Richard, 
we needed to be able to tackle some of the kind of perceptions the industry have around the planning difficulties in Bath. So securing outline planning permission for the site to demonstrate that the site could come forward was another key action of the authority and that enabled us to get to the start block of thinking about and starting to develop the site for those economic purposes we talked about. You move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, so, and this is the journey we've been on really, which is to start to think about how we're creating 6,000 new jobs for the city within the enterprise zone, three and a half thousand new homes within the city, you know, homes for economically active people close to the city center that enables sustainable active travel to come forward. The bridge is very much a key linking point to that, which was a piece of an enabling infrastructure that will in future link together new cycle infrastructure to link across the river through into the city centre and out to some of our communities towards the west of the city and also to, to de-risk some of that market failure that Bath has seen with no new offices built for 30 years where new office provision in the form of grade A office environments suitable for our growing businesses could be delivered by the council alongside then the very specialist nature of delivering and refurbishing the historic buildings which clearly TCN um, have come on board for. Next slide please. So yeah this is very much about how we worked with partners and, uh, and we have many um, on the scheme and how we brought together public partners in the form of the Environment Agency utilising you know the strength of the West of England Combined Authority and funding opportunities to bring those partners together to realise delivery um, locally for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. So that's been what, one or two decades work? Yes, um, it's well, like I say, it, you know, this this emanates from 2005, but substantively work started in 2015. So it's not quite that long, Claire, but um, <laughs> you know, these these projects do take time. And I think, you know, um, you know, you've sometimes you have to allow for that time. You have to allow these things to, to, to you know, come forward at their pace and not force it. So and, and Richard joined you on that journey um, back in. 2015. So how did TCN and Baines get into partnership and, and, and what convinced you that it was a partnership with potential? Well, uh, hello everybody, Richard Pierce from TCN. Uh, thanks Claire for the introduction and Simon. I think um, where did we first meet was 2012. We were launching the Bristol Enterprise Zone with Temple Studios um, at that time and uh, George Osborne was on the stage in those days selling the virtues of enterprise zones for Bristol and in fact um, through that some of the Bath enterprise or regeneration team were there and uh, we spoke afterwards and they liked what they'd heard about what we'd done at Temple Studios and said we've got this amazing site in Bath come and have a look and we'll have a chat so that's where it started back in 2012. I think, you know, for us locally in Bath, it started around creating a really clear objective um, and through engagement and consultation, building a consensus that that was the right objective for the city in tackling some of our economic challenges locally um, to meet the needs of our residents going forward. So, so identifying and creating that kind of singular purpose that the council should use its land assets for economic purpose to try and enhance the offer um, and address some market failure in the city was very much the kind of key, key objective to galvanise behind. Um, and then it was around assembling and identifying the role the council needed to play, to play on the public sector strengths to enable this to happen, whilst creating the opportunity for, for the market and market partners to come on board to help us manage the risk in areas where perhaps local government and local authorities aren't best placed to manage those risks or aren't, um, don't have the right risk appetite um, to invest that level of commitment to enable these sites to come forward. Um, so for us, that partnership was really formed around, I think that the strength of the offer um, Bath and North East Somerset Council could provide in terms of committing to and finding successful funding solutions um, for 
the enabling works, the bridge works, um, those that flood scheme that I mentioned. And, and we were really quite innovative with the Environment Agency around how we essentially formed a contractual partnership with the Environment Agency to enable us to use some of the Environment Agency powers to implement flood works on third party land, without which we couldn't have got a flood scheme away and delivered to enable these sites to come forward. So in doing those things, it enabled us to start that kind of market testing, those market conversations with, with the likes of Richard to enable us to identify and, and kind of start to get some alignment with the types of partners that would be a good fit for the city and a good fit for our objectives long term. Yeah, and I think uh, in terms of the, the council finding the right partners, we were able to um, draw on some of our experiences in other locations uh, and also demonstrate market demands as well. So, you know, we've been very active in, in Southwest for a while. So we could have, have conversations and give insight into what the demand was, what people were looking for from an occupational point of view and, and help build that sort of vision and direction for the council. And clearly, you know, Bath's got a very strong dynamic economy, but as Simon said, not the space. So we could demonstrate that actually there was quite a high percentage of our occupiers in our Bristol projects that were actually Bath businesses that had come along the train because, you know, the space just wasn't available in Bath. So we could bring that sort of knowledge and insight from a wider pool of experience to help council really assess what the vision was and what they were looking to do. I think, Richard, providing that certainty that actually there was a credible plan for, you know, a, a, the infrastructure and how this site came enabled. Um, I think, you know, quite often um, public procurement and the public processes would tend to put a wrapper around all of this together um, and bundle it up as a singular proposition to the market through either, a, you know, a large procurement activity or a you know, a single, um, a single land transaction type process. Um, and what we realized, I think, very early on is, um, you know, in going through some mar soft market testing and, and really kind of getting into an understanding um, with the industry, um, the development sector, the investment sector around where those risks, um, the perception of those risks lay, um, we reached a, you know, a very clear consensus, I think, that, that the public sector strengths in, you know, what I think the public sector do really well, which is, which is really understanding the local infrastructure need of a city um, and understanding how we best deliver that and how we bring together public sector sources of finance and funding to enable that very much came, up, came alongside the process of then thinking about the types of partner and the types of organisation that, that, that we would want to perhaps um, see invest in our city going forward. So that, that kind of process of how we aligned those objectives and got a common kind of sense of, 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 of purpose, I think was a, was a very strong foundation for that partnership. I think that's right. And I think, you know, being able to highlight other projects that had similar um, aspects that, that were the aspiration of Bath was very useful. Um, and there was a lot of work, not just with TCN, actually, the council were, you know, as you say, soft marketing with various entities just to really understand what the vision was and um, how that could be delivered. And then, Simon, I think it's fair to say that, you know, there was at least three variations of, of proposition as to how this might then actually be packaged together and you know for, for a time certainly TCN were happy to um, be sort of partnered up with a potential occupier that was going to take the site and then we'd come in as a sort of part of that project um, that didn't work out so it was it was very much testing and probing and looking for the right way to bring this forward which takes time and and um, you know work on everyone's behalf but as a result of that early sort of challenging and, and making sure we got it right, I think then the council managed to put together a partnership that then has stood the test of time. And, yeah, and I, th I think it's definitely, sorry, Claire. That's all right, you go, Simon. I was gonna say, I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think that, that kind of, that scrutiny of, of, of just sort of, you know, working through those challenges and working through the options um, uh, at the early stages really does pay dividends further down the line. And I think, you know, 
for us, a lot of this has been around finding that alignment of, of purpose um, and finding an organisation and a partner that has the same sort of sense of civic pride and civic understanding that, that the council does in terms of the legacy that we're trying to create through this yeah. type of project. Yeah, rather that's than ex- just the development returns, but I've perhaps stolen your thunder with an Yeah, expression. no, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to ask you, Simon. So thank you for going on to that. I mean, it's evident that it's a project that it's taken, you know, quite a long time to get off the ground. There've been quite a lot of bumps along the road. Um, so it'd just be really interesting to kind of hear about a few of those hurdles. And I think we have already, um, but that's sort of talking to the past. In the future, how, how do you see the partnership working between TCN and Baines um, as um, Bath Keys becomes live um, as an occupied site? Richard, do you want to sort of outline perhaps first the kind of vision for, for your kind of occupational strategy? And then I'll perhaps build on that around why it's such a good fit um, yeah. for the city and for the council in particular. Yeah, I think, you know, looking, the question sort of relates to looking forward, but I think to give it some context of where it's come from is important. So, you know, our vision was very much to bring the SME, the small and medium sized enterprises, creative industries or creative and digital industries to Bath and give them a real campus with some scale that, that gives a creative campus to Bath and, and to stop the leakage to other places such as Bristol. Um, that's always been our vision. You know, we're long term. Uh, we want to op- we want to develop these things and then operate them for the long time, long term, and really embed ourselves in in the community, which Simon's alluded to. So that's always our very clear vision on anything we do, and that obviously resonated with Bath and, and their long term vision and, and passion, which we share. So that's where we've come into it. We could see with Bath Keys itself. Um, the council were brave enough to take on the investment and development of, of number one Bath Keys, which is the 55,000 square foot new build, grade A on the site. We could then see our 40,000 square foot historic buildings um, next door to that really complementing and working as part of that ecosystem with the smaller businesses and the more uh, perhaps you know, dynamic and entrepreneurial businesses sitting alongside the more established ones in the newer building. So we could see a very clear vision coming together for the whole site with absolute alignment with Bath that this is going to be a dynamic business community um, with five to 600 people in each building. So there's a real dynamism as that's before the, the general public come onto the site, which it's very much designed to do with, with bars or certainly cafes, et cetera, on the river. So that vision was always very clear and, and we could see that that was Bath as well. And that's been very important in terms of the confidence to keep pushing on with the scheme and, and getting it to um, where we're nearly at now, which is launch in the summer. So that's that's um, looking forward. Where do we see the partnership in Bath Keys? Well, we see it becoming exactly that, which is a, is a mix of offer for Bath, which doesn't really exist at the moment. There's a lot of very beautiful Georgian buildings with offices above and the lower ground as the um, probably the agents call it um, but what we don't have is um, you know really established business space which is what Bath Keys um, gives so we see it being a dynamic community of businesses we want to attract new businesses into the area but also we want to provide space for some incredible businesses in Bath uh, that want to stay in Bath and there's, I mean, uh, there's a great pool of talent coming out of the universities and, and the lifestyle clearly in, in the Southwest and Bath is, is very strong. So those are all the sort of attributes that, you know, staff are wanting, employers want to, in the war of talent, you need those sort of uh, elements uh, for a scheme. So that's very much evident in Bath. So we see it becoming a vibrant community with people that are committed to it. So we want people to come and make this their home and hopefully within the ecosystem that we're creating, um, grow and expand and retain those businesses within the, within the economy in, in Bath. And that's key for us really as well, which is creating both capacity in terms of availability of office supply and employment space within the city and flexibility as well was really key. Um, and some of those decisions were born out of, you know, a, a, a taking a balanced approach to how we, consider risk investment and commercial risk um, and you know the council not um, not 
extending or stretching itself beyond its capabilities and um, and working with organizations and partners that really are experts in their own field with with the with a long-term view of their investment return rather than a short-term development return. And, and that's the, the, the sort of fit. Um, I go back to, you know, some, some of the kind of, um, some of the future legacy and future um, kind of strengths of what we're trying to achieve together are born out of an understanding of where the city was, you know, and where, a few years ago, where you know we had a, you know, we had 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 no new significant employment development in the city for over thirty years. Um, we had a, you know, a flat lining office rental um, ceiling, which hadn't really changed or moved on or kept a pace even with the you know, Bristol office market, Swindon office market, we'd fallen behind. And that was all down to the fact that it wasn't that there wasn't significant unmet demand in the city. And we were actually losing a lot of companies from Bath who, you know, very successfully would entrepreneurially set up, um, would grow very quickly and then find that they'd sort of outgrow Bath very quickly, principally and quite often because of the unavailability of office stock. So, you know, the council stepping in and meeting that market failure by investing itself in with a commercial return and borrowing to invest in new office supply enabled us to balance that risk off, but bring someone else in alongside us as a partner that is much better at managing the risk of the, the sensitive refurbishment of an old building, but very much purpose to create a really kind of unique dynamic offer and flexible offer that perhaps is something that as, an, as a council is not our, well, it's certainly not our core business, as many of you will know, but um, it certainly would also be, a, you know, a significant stretch to our resources and our skills, whereas actually, you know, the infrastructure, the kind of, you know, enabling these sites to come forward, thinking about how they connect and relate to our communities, and then thinking about what creates a, you know, a fairly low risk, sound financial return for the authority, um, enabled us to get very good alignment, I think, with TCN because they, you know, they have a really, really outstanding track record, particularly with these type of buildings, which, you know, really should be kind of celebrated in many respects, these old industrial buildings, you know, this is completely unique for Bath. We, we have a lot of Georgian, you know, historic, beautiful Georgian buildings, but very few historic beautiful industrial building so to bring an operator in board that really kind of understands that um, for us has been really important yeah and I think that you know as you say the investment that you guys made which wouldn't necessarily be viable for the private sector has, has allowed us to then come in at a point where um, there's some viability for us and I think that's key for any public private you know partnership and where other councils and operators are looking at bringing this type of scheme forward clearly with the levelling up agenda um, and the funds that can be made available to councils, there's an element uh, and, and the skill set and ability for councils to come in and facilitate those enabling works, whether it be flood defences or opening up infrastructure like the bridge, um, which then makes it viable for a, for a developer and operator like us to come in and clearly to get these things off the ground, there's, there's a lot of challenges. And I think that facilitating work by councils just gets that first hurdle out of the way, which then allows these conversations to come through. And what's been really evident in this process, and I know is, has been helpful for the council, is having a partner that has the capacity to um, develop and operate. And I think that's something that the real estate industry struggles to do. There's a lot of um, partners that will come in and develop and look at a profit, you know, certainly if they're backed by traditional sort of real estate money, i.e. private equity or similar, you know, with a four-year turnaround and a doubling of equity and all those sorts of financial um, targets, which doesn't sit comfortably with a long-term um, investment like this. So, so the industry, I'm saying, really, we need more um, operators or partners that can not only develop and take on the nuances of quite big capital projects, but also have the interest and business model that keeps them involved for the longer term and operates because that combination is, is a very powerful combination uh, to then partner with councils across the country because that's what's lacking for councils. They've got funding, they've got vision, but 
part of that implementation they just haven't got the ability or capacity to do and that's where there is a real opportunity for the private sector to step up and and move away slightly from just purely the developer um max out you know early value and exit and start to look at the slightly longer term involvement particularly because obviously lease structures require that esg requires that sustainability requires that and clearly regeneration requires it so there's quite a shift i think that's needed by the private sector to to equip themselves to take a longer term view and operate as well as as develop so that plays to the next question what what did you do differently here i think you've already answered that question um but what risks were there for each of you um, and how did they differ uh i think again um i'll come back to the sort of the the the, the enabling process you know that the, the the site is incredibly complicated, actually, and complex, you know, um, from from a historic point of view, from the Kirtledge listing point of view. So a lot of the risk is born out of the unique nature of the site and the characteristics we were dealing with. Um, so why this was different was, was really there were some fundamental basic kind of um, infrastructure requirements that we needed to sort out before... I think, you know, even the council in some ways would invest in the, the kind of outcome of achieving um, in, new employment space in the city. Um, and to do that, the differentiator here for us was really establishing a strong relationship and partnership with the Environment Agency as a foundation to unlock the site. That, that's a, you know, and that model has been now replicated in other places around yeah. the UK. So that, that's, that's a key differentiator. But the other basic ingredients, I think, are, are understanding and linking together the benefits the public sector can bring through its myriad sources of funding and different outcomes it's trying to seek, um, together with understanding a really clear kind of planning strategy for a site that is, you know, very historic and, and complex to enable um, a, a planning certainty that then provides the private sector an investable proposition to go and secure finance and investment on. You know, doing that all as public sector by trying to grant fund the whole thing would be almost impossible. So that, that was one of the key differentiators. And then I think, um, a, and it was, you know, a, a little bit of kind of optioneering and, and toing and froing almost with coming up with the right structure that enabled, you know, um, Richard and, and TCN to, 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 to come on board and, and, um, and, and start to work with the council um, was the other one. So were there lessons learned from Bath Western Riverside? Um, there, yes, probably. I mean, again, I think I mentioned it, but, you know, some of the building blocks around this are around understanding, you know, the, 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 um, the ability to leverage public financing through a state aid compliant publicly procurement compliant route in terms of ensuring that we kind of create the right investment platform to be able to place that public sector funding into schemes in a legitimate kind of state aid compliant manner, but also create the commercial opportunity for companies um, and, and for other partners to bear some of that risk and acknowledging that risk sharing rather than just trying to um, account for it through best consideration, for example. Um, yes, so there were, so, and there were lessons across from previous public procurement exercises. So yeah, what advice would you give to clients wanting to, and councils wanting to repeat this model in other cities or indeed in, in other areas in our, our own city? I think, it, Again, reflecting on it, um, that clarity of objective, I think, is, is, is almost the number one sort of um, unifying feature here, which is we had a real clarity of purpose about addressing an economic need. Um, and whilst there were some peripheral issues to that, it's always remained unanimously centre stage on the, on the requirements to deliver something that does genuinely provide the city with an economic kind of outcome. Um, and provides the space needed where the market, there was that kind of classic market failure condition where 
um, the market wouldn't and couldn't invest because the risk profile was just too high. So I think that that for me is the number one thing is be really clear on your objectives, get alignment. And because these projects take time, build consensus. I think that's the start point. I think then you've got to really explore the kind of and be quite tenacious about exploring the routes to combine different strands. Leveling up is going to be a good opportunity for many places because it does draw together those themes and strands mm -hmm. into one unifying kind of front door approach to government, which when we started this journey just didn't exist. So you had to go hunting almost for the different strands of funding to draw them together to make the case. But now leveling up, um, the leveling up perspectives and leveling up kind of does draw that together. So, but I do think, you know, be really clear on the outcomes. And for you, Richard? Well, I think alignment, so you've got that vision and objective Simon talks about, but then it's working out how you get the alignment to keep the interest aligned. And it, that's, you know, absolutely key. And I think on this one, you know, just so people are clear how it's structured, um, the site is, you know, is owned freehold by the council. The new grade A office building is, is built and owned by the council and then Newark Works uh tcn um effectively bought a long lease through the procurement process bought a long lease on on that site and by long lease i mean i can't remember 150 years i think it is so that gave us a fundable asset that we had um and then we were also uh, obliged under contract to then invest the capex to bring forward the the scheme at newark work so that was very important to the council because what they didn't want was a um, sort of sharp old developer buying a site and then sitting on it for years. It had to be delivered. So, so that it was clever in alignment. So, you know, we were invested as an owner. Um, we also run an obligation to complete the build uh, and as a, as a creative campus. So that meant alignment was actually absolutely in tune with each other. And, you know, any, any success or decision around the whole site, uh, was a, a, a success or a failure for all of us um so you know that for me is is a really important lesson because the other ways the other way things were looked at here was that the council could have brought in an operator and, and provide the funding and sort of develop the site for an operator but there's no risk for the operator there they sit there and wait for the scheme and then they can come in if it works great if it doesn't they're off again so the council getting someone to come in as an owner with absolute you know buy-in gave them comfort that we weren't going to disappear and it gave us comfort that we've got a, a financeable um you know asset that we can we can develop out and own for the long term it does so come back to that risk appetite point as well you know you've got to understand and accept the appetite for risk of the organization and lots of councils are in different places with that and have different capabilities i think also it was about drawing together and acknowledging that there are different routes and different options across one scheme. So while Bath Key South, um, we have a particular delivery strategy for, and it was around kind of, you know, first and foremost, kind of um, meeting that market failure, creating that investment and, and demonstrating um, to the, in the wider industry that would want to come and invest, that we had a credible delivery plan. Um, you know, on Bath Keys North, which is the Avon Street car park site, we, we've balanced that sort of risk profile by taking a different approach. And whilst with, uh, with TCN, it was very much, it was a land-led approach. So it was a land lease transaction um, that, that, that enabled the council to keep a distinct separation between the public sector investment in infrastructure for public good um, and, the, and the risk profile that TCN were prepared to take on board through the existing use value of the asset of the old new works so you know we valued that risk um, and that played into the structure Bath Keys North and, and, and that went through a different public procurement route so I suppose the, 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 the takeaway is there's no one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. solution but actually what there is is a whole myriad of mix and match options that you need to assess and relate to your organization's risk profile. I think that for me is the kind of key takeaway. So Richard, do you find in Bristol it's, it, you're adopting the same model and in Norwich and in the other locations that you have offices in the country? Or are they all different? They're all slightly different. 
Um, but all the principles remain the same. So, um, you know, I think that long term approach is is something that really um, resonates with, with everyone. Um, that's the buy in. That's that's the long term. You make very different decisions. Clearly, we all know that if you're in for the long term <laughs> and if you have some ownership, um, the decision making process is very different to, to a short term in and out. So. Yeah, there's similarities, but, you know, if you look at what we did with the BBC in London, for example, um, they had a very ugly building next to White City, next to the uh, television centre. So we rebranded that, the ugly building, and, and turned it into a creative campus. But that was a 12-year lease, um, which is much more a P&L model, because at the time the BBC didn't want to let that asset go. So that, that worked in a different way. That was more of a lease structure. But, you know, we invested the CapEx there, and we did a turnover rent. And what that did was deliver the BBC a fantastic, very startup creative campus that helped facilitate all the development that's now gone on there. So that was a different type of model. So again, as an operator, as a developer, you've got to be adaptable. So um, that comes down to who's backing you, how you're financed. Um, but the fundamental themes are the same. If you, if you get alignment, clear vision, and um, a long-term view, then I think you're onto a good thing. And, if you do it a different way, you know, as I say, if, if the council provides the funding and brings an operator in, that's another great way of doing it. But the council's gone up the risk, risk curve a bit. So that's a great way to, to end this part of the, of the masterclass. And now we've got lots of great questions from the audience. Um, some of them are quite tricky. So I'll start with an easy one. <laughs> what are you both most proud of on, on, the, on the Keys project? Time with well, Simon. Oh, Simon. Simon. <laughs> um, I, I suppose just getting to this point, I think I'm really, really proud of, given the journey we've been on. Um, but there are little things about the site that I'm really proud of. Um, I'm particularly proud of the investment we made to increase the sustainability of our office development by, you know, increasing and adding. Um, some of the fabric based um, improvements we've made. So we started this journey a long way before the council had declared its climate emergency before, you know, a long way in a different part L world even. So we've created a lot of investment. I'm actually quite proud of, of the fact that, you know, we, we could really, you know, with a design and a construction team, we could integrate and retrofit some pretty, um, some pretty effective measures at getting this, you know, building almost to a carbon neutral stage. I, I can't say it's carbon neutral because we're at EPCA, um, but we, we've almost got there through a retrofit process because we'd already committed and designed the building and got planning for the building before that was a, a, a clear enough objective. The other thing I'm really actually really proud of is the ability to... Uh, um, accommodate the little stod on pit crane that a set of volunteers <laughs> um, have restored and, and, uh, and um, someone donated actually, which was a very historic old crane that used to be used on site to build other cranes in the stod on pit crane making days. Um, and that is being cited and it has been incorporated into the public realm. And I think it's just a beautiful little kind of link to the history of the site that has been um, integrated so successfully. So that's one of my proudest sort of little features on the site actually yeah yeah and it was one of the biggest engineering challenges for us <laughs> well, you, yeah. <laughs> getting the crane onto the site <laughs> you could probably do a masterclass on how you managed to fit that in yeah. <laughs> richard for you um, there's there's probably two for me which is um stothard and pitt who were the occupier that built new at works originally in 1850 and something um used to be the biggest employer in bath so you know five six hundred people employed um, it had a, a, a sad ending in, um, in fact, Robert Maxwell bought the company eventually mm. in 88. So we all know, well, most of us will know the, how that ended. So it sat there for a long time, empty and, and a sad reflection of what had happened to probably industry. And so to see all that coming back and peeling back the history and finding all these incredible crane, cranes in the building and turnstiles and all sorts of history is just awesome. And to see that coming back to life and giving a home to the creative industries of Bath is just fantastic because Bath has a very, very strong um, creative digital tech community um, through virtue of some amazing employers like Dyson, et cetera, and also the universities. And they're quite, 
that was spread out or lost in, in all the little buildings around the place. And so to bring, to give that industry a heart and a focus is is really exciting. And I just, you know, that's that's a huge amount of pride is taken from that and seeing people, you know, seeing the positive change and the enabling the business growth, which is what we always try and target within TCN is very exciting. Number two is, is that sustainability point. Um, we've proven with this building um, that the embedded carbon in a building like this um, is significant. And if you can refurbish it and regenerate it in a clever way, you can actually make a very, very sustainable um, business case for this, this type of regeneration. And um, I don't want to steal your thunder particularly, but your company That's did right. some great, great work around <laughs> what carbon's gone into this versus an equivalent new build building. And it's staggering. I mean, we are 25% of the carbon it takes to build a new building versus what we've done with the regeneration of an old or recycling of an old. So, you know, that's involved for us, um, huge new insulation of roofs. We've replaced all the windows. We've looked very carefully at how we heat and light the building um, through the best renewable sources we can find. So through the recycling of the building and then, and then the work on top of that that we've done to it, it feels like we're really proving a model which in its own little way clearly helps ESG in the environment. But hopefully through the ripple effect, we can demonstrate by doing masterclasses like this and talking to people in industry, a real life case study of how you can recycle an old building and um, have, a, have a positive or, or limit the impact of the carbon input on, on developing these types of buildings. So as number two, that's, that's a hugely proud thing. And we want to use this, as I say, as a case study to kind of try and champion that a bit more in the industry. OK, so on to the more tricky questions. I think this one, this is one for Simon. Um, how do you coordinate the programme to allow for multiple different projects to happen at the same time? Uh, yeah, there's always a challenge on that. Um, <laughs> particularly, again, particularly you're sort of trying to balance aren't you, that old Venn diagram of kind of cost, quality and time across a program and I think you know it's probably rightly for, for this scheme for this site kind of quality has quite often tended to dominate the cost and time parameters within with it within the sort of the project um there are some there are some common things though um you know and we've been successful at kind of trying to we work very closely actually even though we've got completely different kind of procurement gateways completely different kind of project programming gateways we work very closely to try and align the outcomes and the supply chain we've used. So what, one of the things is try and reduce the number of touch points you've got between those projects by using common consultants, common supply chain, common contractors. And even though we both as partners independently made our own decisions around how we arrive at that, I think that's really helped coordinate the programming of the scheme to manage the packages and contracts in a way that does coordinate them successfully but I do think you know we have a very unique project here and, and I come back to that point that you know when you when you're comparing the kind of cost quality time equation particularly with the kind of challenges of the refurbishment of a, of a historic building in the condition it was in when Richard took it on you, you know you have to accept some flex in that cost and time mm -hmm. um, dynamic yeah, and for us, it was very important that um, we had absolute control over our procurement process. You know, as, as Simon says, they, you know, the decision making, the, the, the beasts that they are are very different. So it was paramount that we had our own procurement process. We went down the traditional route. Um, you know, we're on site making decisions as they happen. You know, we've all redeveloped houses. Probably you, you pull something, you know, off and find something you weren't expecting. So we had to be able to have a, have a procurement process that allowed us to sort of roll with the punches um on that side of it and make fast decisions and, and that was really important to us that we had that independence we we took it to the market and did a full sort of tender process and and happily you know we were very keen to use the same contractor for all the obvious reasons that sam's mentioned and happily that worked out we market tested it and still that was the right route to go and in hindsight you know that was absolutely critical there's no way we could have tried to be using different people and having doubling up on so much so many aspects of it Great. Now, the next question is on financing. And I think we've already talked to this um, quite a lot already. But the question is, how did the financing structure make this project possible? 
Um, again, yeah, I did. I sort of referenced it from from previous, but it, it was about bringing together a number of public funding sources that enabled us to legitimately, in a state aid compliant way, kind of place that funding into infrastructure um, and de-risk the site to enable the private sector finance to come on board and take risk in areas where the council were uncomfortable to take risk. So what 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 that involved that actually was you know in partnership with the environment agency being able to leverage in flood flood, um, flood risk funding from the environment agency alongside um section 106 and sill funding that the, the council brought to bear to, to fund the flood works um, around looking at and drawing in sustainable active travel funding for the bridge links and and, and the, the, the you know the connectivity pieces and then around the council making a sound investment case to itself around investing in the new build offices as a commercial return. So yeah, there was a number of mechanisms to finance and, and to a degree that then led the kind of delivery strategy for the scheme, which meant that, you know, if we had approached, if we'd taken that all to the market, we would have had to go out in one very protracted, very complicated mm. procurement process to enable us to, to place that public sector funding into a procurement compliant vehicle. What we've actually done is carried the risk and invested in that public infrastructure as a public body, but that's enabled Richard to come on board and TCN to take the risk on some of those really high risk intricate bits around the sensitive refurbishment of the building where the council's risk was crystallized through a design and build contract, which we could we, we could kind of close down and, 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 and manage through the contracting and procurement process for the new office. So that was how it all came together in a financing structure. And perhaps Richard will then add what that means to the kind of his, his funders and financiers around what, what that brings for their investment. Yep, so as Simon says, Bath created a, what I call a platform, really. They, they created a platform that we could see could be delivered um, with the various packages of works. So we could see, you know, the bridge committed to their grade A building going in. And what they also created then was with the flood defence works as well, was certainty that um, you know, those aspects were, were being delivered. And then they also managed through that to create relatively clean title that we could then take on um, and as a traditional sort of acquisition really of, of, of the title which we could then raise development funding against um, which is a which is a typical private sector funding arrangement which is demonstration of the end product and value um, and then we could raise development funding against um, against the asset so that was as I said earlier that was critical otherwise we just wouldn't be able to raise the sort of money that's required um, without having the asset that, that's bankable so so we're very much sort of development funding. Um, and then once that funding's through and assuming we haven't made a completely wrong call, we can let it up and have the values that we expect, then we'll bring in more traditional bank funding on for the longer term investment. So it's a sort of, for us, it's an organic approach. We start with development funding, um, proof of concept, get the thing full and let um, with a market value, and then we can bring in longer term investment financing. So. It's all about getting that right development um, financing in the early stages to give you the time and the ability to bring it forward. We've done it uh, completely speculatively, so that's perhaps a little unusual because uh, through our track record and proof of concept in 10, 12 different locations over the last 15 years, we've been able to prove to funders that, that we, we hopefully have got a decent track record and you know we can build this thing out and we've made a good call on, on the market. There's no getting away from the fact that it's a big prize. You know, it's Central Bath. It's a fantastic location. It will be in high demand. So, as Simon says, it's high risk, but um, it's it will be a, a valuable asset at the end of it. So, that's how we got through the funding. Yeah. So it's a big, complex project that was broken down into a series of components that could be delivered separately, but as a as a whole piece. Exactly right. And that goes back to that original levelling up point of having the funding on the government side to be able to do the enabling work to create that platform that then you can break down into the packages. So then that created interfaces between all the different projects. Managing those interfaces, Simon? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, trying to limit that number of interfaces has been 
you know, particularly once you get into the delivery phase has been um, essential really. Um, so, you know, thinking about the commonality of, you know, who, who's doing your engineering, who's doing your project management, what, act, what route to market and construction and contracting have you got? It all helps to kind of coordinate those interfaces. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think that, that for me has been the, um, the sort of takeaway from it um, is that you do need to, yeah, you can't always control the way funding comes together to enable these things but what you can do is understand how that might interface and understand where your supply chain might fit in and where you might find those common touch points fantastic so that has been absolutely fascinating hearing about all the twists and turns um, on the delivery of of bath keys um, i'd like to say a huge thank you to simon and richard for for sharing their experiences um, and I'm sure they will be happy to take any um, any correspondence from anyone on the call who wants to find out more. They're, they have lots and lots of knowledge. So thank you very much for a very inspiring story. Um, and that's the end of the masterclass. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>